Uh, okay, so let me first uh, thank the organizers uh, for putting together this uh, this very, uh, very timely uh, summer school. So as I remember, when I was a student of maybe 15 years ago, I came here uh, to attend uh, one of the uh, PCCM uh, summer schools in the early days, and uh, that was uh, right at the beginning of topological integral. So so we will see that this 2D materials maybe uh, may, may grow into something uh, even bigger. So, uh, so okay. So uh, the first uh, like uh, one and a half lectures, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, topology and quantum geometry in two uh, D materials. Um, so, uh, so we all know that this uh, field of two D materials started from uh, the discovery of uh, graphene, a uh, single sheet of uh, carbon atom, uh, by this remarkable, uh, somewhat low tech method uh, using a scotch tape uh, to exfoliate uh, from graphite. Uh, very thin flakes of a few layers of graphene, including uh, monolayer graphene. Um, and uh, and uh, this uh, single sheet of carbon atom turned out to have a, a extremely good uh, uh, electrical properties. Uh, it's uh, very easy to uh, work with uh, in making devices, stable in air, has very high uh, mobilities, uh, and more, uh, perhaps most importantly that its electronic property can be uh, controlled uh, by applying a gate voltage. So uh, this is uh, from early days, uh, with the plot of resistance as a function of gate voltage, which changes the carry density in the system. And you see that the, uh, the system uh, shows a resistance peak uh, at the charging trolley point, and uh, it can be made from n-type into p-type. So at the charging trolley point, uh, resistance is, is high but does not diverge. So uh, this is the first sign that uh, uh, graphene is not an insulator. Um, so uh, graphene is also very attractive to uh, to theorists, uh, especially to uh, pen and paper theorists like myself. Uh, so you know, just using the simplest uh, type binding model uh, of the honeycomb lattice, uh, one can solve the uh, band structure, and uh, this serves as an extremely good uh, starting point for understanding the numerous properties of, gra of graphene. Um, so then, uh, uh, so in fact, uh, this. Uh, nice properties of graphene are also attracted to theorists. Uh, even before this 2D graphene was uh, was experimentally discovered uh, in the 1980s, uh, Daniel Hordain wrote this uh, famous paper uh, showing that topological states can arise from graphene. This is one of the uh, earliest uh, examples of a topological state uh, in the absence of uh, uh, external magnetic field. And um, uh, it's a quantum Hall state. Uh, but doesn't have uh, lambda levels. Instead, it has a well-defined uh, band structure uh, that comes from uh, electrons moving in the periodic potential in the 2D uh, honeycomb lattice. <coughs> and uh, a crucial ingredient uh, that is introduced in this paper is this time reversal symmetry uh, breaking, uh, which is not present uh, in a real graphene, uh, but as a toy model, uh, it illustrated uh, this concept of topology. And then uh, in uh, 2005, 2004, uh, Kane and Malie introduced uh, another type of uh, 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 theoretically a new terms to the uh, graphene. And uh, back, back then, uh, they were actually uh, inspired by the uh, experimental discovery of graphene and thinking what can be done. And um, they introduced a, a spin orbit term, uh, and that leads to a new class of topological states, now known as. Uh, Topological insular, uh, the two dimensional version uh, of it is also known as the quantum spin hole state. And this is a state that's protected by uh, a time reversal symmetry. So these two are the uh, uh, sort of topological uh, uh, states that the theorists came up with in the context of graphene. Um, so, uh, so that's why this uh, uh, research on graphene and research on topological uh, states of matter sort of had uh, some sense a common origin. But uh, since then, uh, the two uh, fields diverged. Uh, we all know that graphene uh, made uh, uh, many, many uh, fascinating developments came out of graphene, and uh, and uh, not only a carbon atom, but later the field moved to uh, various two-dimensional materials that can be exfoliated. Uh, it can be made into atomic thin layers, and uh, this is this field of two D materials. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, original models. The uh, Hodain model, the K-Mali model on graphene um, <clears throat> uh, is still uh, not realized, uh, but the general idea of topological insular uh, took off. And uh, in 
uh, two-dimensional topological integers were uh, predicted and discovered uh, in this mercury terabyte, uh, cadmium terabyte uh, thin films. Now, compared with graphing, which you can exfoliate using scotch tape, uh, for this, you really need a sophisticated, very advanced MB machine and probably an army of people uh, to do experiments here. Uh, and then uh, the field also very quickly moved into uh, three-dimensional materials. Uh, these are ball crystals uh, that one can do uh, various uh, transport, spectroscopy, uh, uh, optical experiments. And uh, in particular, this uh, many, many uh, materials, hundreds and thousands of three-dimensional topological inserts were experimentally uh, identified. And uh, so these are very different materials compared to with uh, 2D, 2D materials. Um, however, there's always some uh, underlying connection between the two fields. So for example, if you look at the surface state of a topological insert, this is the photo emission uh, data uh, from the He Hassan's group here, uh, you see that there's this linear dispersing uh, band. So it's uh, very similar to the direct fermion in graphene. Uh, and um, then uh, in recent years, uh, these two fields of 2D materials and topology uh, seems to start <coughs> to cross again. Right, they started across the path again. Uh, this uh, work uh, from uh, last year, San Feng Wu, who is uh, standing uh, back there, uh, showed the uh, first, I think, topological states uh, in the two dimensional material with a single layer of tungsten telluride. Uh, and we will hear uh, later this morning uh, the second speaker, uh, Feng Wan, uh, showing that this so called churning sweater, uh, very close to uh, Hodan's uh, proposal of a quantum pulse state without number levels. Uh, it shows up in trivial graphene on HBN uh, substrate, uh, coming from these uh, correlation effects uh, and emergent ferromagnetism uh, in the uh, Mori superlattice, and the many, many other uh, related works on uh, training suiters. So, <clears throat> so, uh, so, yeah, so this is uh, sort of a very short, uh, 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 maybe um, um, very short history of the, uh, uh, the connection between topology and uh, 2D materials. So, uh, so this is an outline of this, the first lecture. So I'm going to uh, start with uh, high binding models of graphene and showing how the uh, direct fermion uh, arises in the continuum limit. And I'm going to spend some time discussing the symmetry protection of these direct points, uh, what makes graphene gapless. Uh, and then I'll talk about various ways of breaking the symmetry and introducing the direct mass. And these mass terms lead to gap states uh, many of them are topological, and they have interesting topological <laughs> uh, boundary states. And uh, I'll also discuss uh, how uh, topology can be inferred uh, by uh, the parity, the, by the electron wave function. Uh, so, so. Okay, so, um, so let me start with this uh, type binding model for graphene. Uh, so I'm sure that you have seen uh, it many, many times. So let me uh, quickly go through it. Uh, so. It turned out that the uh, uh, conduction valence bands of graphene uh, come from the PZ optical of the carbon atoms. Uh, so the uh, uh, simplest but a pretty accurate model for the electronic structure of graphene, we will start with the PZ optos on every atom, uh, and uh, we introduce uh, hoppings uh, between uh, neighboring sites. So the honeycomb lattice uh, has two sublattices, both made of carbon atom, uh, but there are two of them that are not related to each other by a lattice translation. So I'm going to call these two sublattices A and B. Um, and uh, so this is the, uh, uh, the nearest neighbor hoppings between uh, the uh, three adjacent B atoms to a common uh, A atom. And uh, one can write this Hamiltonian uh, in Fourier space. Uh, and this leads to this uh, block Hamiltonian, which is a two by two uh, matrix. And, uh, and this matrix element here are shown here. Uh, these three terms correspond to hopping between the three uh, adjacent neighbors. And um, when we uh, solve the uh, spectrum, uh, what we get is uh, a band structure uh, shown here. There's conduction band and the valence bands uh, coming from the presence of, of, of two atoms per unit cell. And uh, notice that the conduction valence bands touch at the uh, corner of the Brillouin zone, the so-called K and minus K point. So this is a 2D uh, semi metal. Right, so there's no band gap. So this explains why the resistance of graphene uh, shows a peak but does not diverge at the charge neutrality point when the Fermi energy is right at this band crossing points. Um, so uh, the whole bandwidth 
of uh, conduction valence bands are pretty high, around order of 10 electron volt. Uh, while, uh, so at room temperature or even lower temperatures, uh, the high energy uh, parts of the band structure uh, should not matter. So that's why we are only interested in states uh, in the vicinity of these uh, drag points, of these band crossing points. So for this purpose, uh, we can uh, uh, linearize this block Hamiltonian in the vicinity of these uh, K and K prime points. And this leads us to this uh, low energy uh, continuum uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, so P labels the uh, deviation from K points or the minus K points. So I'm going to use this label C to label these two uh, so-called values. Uh, and then the linearized uh, block Hamiltonian uh, takes this very uh, simple form. Uh, uh, it has this structure, which uh, is uh, essentially a two-dimensional Dirac fermion uh, with two components. Right? Again, the two components arises from the presence of two uh, sublexes, two atoms per unit cell. This Hamiltonian is completely off-diagonal uh, with matrix element uh, either P plus IP or PX minus IPY, depending on which value. So the two values are described by a Dirac equation uh, with opposite uh, chirality. And uh, there's a single parameter uh, in this low energy uh, model, which is the velocity. And in graphing, this velocity is 8 times 10 to the 5 meter per second. And notice that when we arrived, we started with the lattice model, which um, uh, uh, has a certain uh, size of the real zone, but we arrived at the low energy model, which has no intrinsic scales. There's no intrinsic land scales, no intrinsic energy scales. And in fact, it even shows uh, emergent uh, Lorentz invariance. So this kind of phenomena uh, is, is, is quite, uh, quite general, in fact, that uh, uh, when we look at the low energy Hamiltonian, it has more symmetries than the original uh, lattice model. So in the continuum uh, uh, low energy theory, uh, the information about the Brillouin zone size uh, is completely gone. Right? So we end up with continuum model. So, um, so let me uh, uh, mention that uh, sort of the, uh, the physics of the continuum and how the physics of lattice scales are related to each other. Uh, so one thing to note is that uh, when we look at the wave function obtained uh, from this low energy continuum Hamiltonian, it really describes the envelope function, uh, while the actual block wave function uh, has more structure to it. For example, if we plot uh, the, uh, the continuum uh, wave function at p equals zero, one would think that uh, it's just a plane wave, uh, which is completely structureless. Uh, a, a plane wave at p equals zero is just a constant. However, if we really look at the block wave function at the k point, right? So p equals zero uh, in this continuum uh, model corresponds to the k point at the corner of the Brillouin zone. The actual block wave function uh, it has a very, very interesting structure. Uh, it is shown here. Uh, it, you know, the wave function uh, has different phase factors. Uh, on different sites, right? So that has phase factors, you know, 1 e to the i 2 pi over 3 e to minus i 2 pi over 3. And this phase factor is coming from this uh, e to the i k dot r, where k is the uh, larger momentum uh, of the uh, Brillouin zone, right? So we want to be careful when we translate the uh, envelope function obtained from the continuum theory to the actual electron wave function uh, on the lattice. Related to that, uh, the form of the drag Hamiltonian itself is not gauge invariant. For example, uh, in this uh, particular uh, choice of basis, I've grouped you know, these A and B atoms on the horizontal bond together within the unit cell, uh, and that leads to this form of the Dirac Hamiltonian, where you know, let's say the plus k value has a chirality which is p minus ip. Uh, but this again uh, is a matter of, 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 of gate choice. Okay? So it's very important that when we compare the results of continuum theory, uh, we, we have to all translate uh, physical uh, all results into the actual uh, physical wave functions on the lattice. So likewise, the allowed term in the continuum theory must be determined by the symmetry of the original lattice. Okay, so um, so now let's look at this uh, uh, important question: you know, why graphene itself is capless? Why the conduction valence bands touch uh, instead of uh, having a level a repulsion instead of uh, developing a gap? So uh, any degeneracy uh, in uh, in physics uh, needs an explanation. Okay. So is the situation here. So now one way to understand this uh, degeneracy at the k-point is using a group theory uh, from the symmetry of the honeycomb lattice. 
uh, when the uh, two sublattices are equivalent, they are both carbon atoms in the case of graphene, uh, this Honeycomb lattice has uh, uh, high degrees of, of symmetry and including a three-fold rotation around the center of the hexagon and a left-right uh, reflection. Right? And uh, this uh, group uh, leads to a two-dimensional representation. It allows a two-dimensional representation uh, and, and the two uh, bands are crossed at this k-point. They exactly form into this two-dimensional representation. So provided this C3V symmetry is present, this general C uh, is protected. Uh, however, it turns out that the uh, gapless nature of graphene uh, is uh, more robust. Uh, so let's consider breaking the three for rotation symmetry and breaking the mirror symmetry by adding, uh, by, by deforming the graphene. So for example, imagine graphene being stretched along the uh, x direction so that the hopping uh, between horizontal bonds is now t plus delta t. It's different from the other two hoppings. So this breaks three for rotation symmetry. Uh, one can also imagine introducing diagonal hoppings uh, you know, uh, across the uh, hexagon, and this will break all the reflection symmetries. Uh, it turns out that even with these perturbations, the degeneracy at the uh, k and plus, minus k points are lifted, indeed. So the, uh, the symmetry uh, is gone, and the degeneracy is lifted. However, the band crossing points are not removed. They just shift to a different point uh, in the Brillouin zone. And in fact, uh, to when the uh, perturbation to these hoppings are small, uh, one can uh, look at the change of the block Hamiltonian at the level of the continuum theory. And it turned out that uh, these modified hoppings, they play the role of a vector potential. Okay? They uh, enter the continuum Hamiltonian in the same way that the vector potential couples to uh, electrons. And this vector potential has nothing to do with external magnetic field. We're still talking about uh, zero magnetic field, uh, but it purely coming from these uh, strain that introduces uh, the modified hopping delta t. Uh, one difference from the real magnetic field is that here, uh, the modified hoppings, the preserved time reversal symmetry, so this vector potential actually has opposite side of the two values. So essentially what this means is that a strain acts as a vector potential that is opposite of the two values, and then it follows from this that if we have a spatially varying strain, that is equivalent to a uh, spatially varying vector potential, and that will generate a magnetic field. So uh, this is one of the uh, early uh, uh, example of why this direct model is useful for understanding electronic structure of graphene. So it, it leads to this prediction that strain generates a pseudo magnetic field that gives lambda levels, and that was experimentally observed uh, by uh, first by my Chromis group at Berkeley. So for us, uh, I just want to uh, note here that. Uh, uh, what this example shows is that the three-four rotation and reflection symmetry is sufficient for protecting direct point, but it's not necessary. So there's a deeper origin to the uh, uh, to the uh, direct points in graphene. So uh, so it turned out that uh, what, what we would like to do is basically to come up with a topological uh, argument why this direct point is protected. And um, so. This is similar to the topological uh, characterization of vortices, right? So if you want to understand why there has to be a vortex at this point, uh, we can look at the velocity field far away, which is where the, the velocity everywhere is non-singular, and there's a vorticity, which is the winding number of the vortex field. And when the winding number is non-zero, we know that there has to be a singularity somewhere in the middle, right? So likewise, uh, a Dirac point is a band crossing point, uh, but we would like to uh, infer the existence of this band crossing point by taking a contour uh, 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 that encloses this point. So along that contour, uh, we can, there's a well-defined band. For example, can, let's look at this connection band. That's well-defined. And uh, it turns out the analog of this vorticity is this barrier phase associated with uh, the electron wave function, which I call UK. Uh, so this UK describes the electron wave function uh, within the unit cell. So in the case of graphene, we know there are two different atoms, there are two atoms in, in the unit cell. So in the type binding model, this UK is a two component uh, wave function. So, um, so this, there's this quantity called a barrier connection that's defined this way, right? So it, it's a derivative of the UK and then in the product with itself. Uh, so this vector potential is, uh, is uh, not gauge invariant. So when we change the wave function by a k dependent phase factor, uh, this uh, barrier connection, 
uh, pick up a gradient term. However, if we take the barrier connection integrate over a closed contour, uh, this leads to the spare phase, uh, which is uh, gauge invariant mod uh, integer multiple of 2 pi. So this e to the i phi is, is, is gauge invariant. Now, um, for a uh, generic system, uh, uh, if we look at a generic band in a generic system, this barrier phase uh, will generally be a phase factor that can be anywhere between 0 and 2 pi. Uh, but uh, it turns out that in the presence of certain symmetries, uh, this barrier phase is quantized, quantized and allowing only two possible values. And that defines this Z2 uh, topological charge. So the symmetry involved here uh, are inversion and time reversal symmetry. Uh, in particular, uh, for now, all we require is the uh, combination of inversion and time reversal. So with this PT symmetry, uh, this barrier phase is quantized to be either 0 or pi, thus defining a Z2 topological charge. And uh, here's the uh, proof. Uh, so notice that uh, time reversal is anti-unitary. So PT is an anti-unitary <coughs> operator uh, that maps the wave function UK to back to itself uh, up to an overall phase. Right? Because both P and T uh, changes K to minus K, so the combination of PT uh, leaves uh, K invariant. Um, also, uh, in the systems without spin orbit coupling, uh, the PT, uh, the square of this operator, uh, is equal to plus one. Okay? So with these two conditions, uh, we can now choose a gauge where uh, the wave function uh, is invariant under this PT at every K. Right? So you know, for any wave function UK, uh, PT acting on it will map it back to itself up to a phase factor. But if we adjust uh, the choice of the phase factor, then uh, we can just make the wave function uh, uh, invariant under PT. <coughs> Notice that um, this uh, choice of the phase factor uh, is unique up to an overall plus minus one sign. So you know, if you give your choice of the wave function that satisfies this property uh, that is invariant under PT, uh, I can multiply it by minus one and it also satisfies this condition. Right? So what this means is that um, if we look at the barrier phase along a closed contour uh, in a system with PT symmetry, uh, I can start with a wave function uh, in this gauge. Uh, and after I go around the closed contour, I come back. Uh, there are two possible possibilities. Either the wave function comes back to itself, or it, it comes back with a minus sign. Okay? And, uh, and this corresponds to barrier phase of 0 and barrier phase of pi. So um, when the barrier phase is pi, uh, we know that uh, there has to be a singularity, that there has to be a band crossing somewhere within the contour, uh, because otherwise uh, we can continuously shrink this contour uh, to a point. And if the, uh, in the absence of any band crossing points, uh, when we look at a small contour around a point, the barrier phase uh, uh, around a small closed uh, loop uh, must be zero instead of pi. So when the barrier phase is quantized to be pi, we know that there has to be a band crossing point enclosed inside. So this is why the drag point is uh, protected by this pi barrier phase in the presence of this PT symmetry. Um, moreover, uh, one can actually uh, even infer the presence of this uh, drag points uh, by the parity of the uh, energy bands. So, so far, I've only used the combination of P and T symmetry. But if, in addition, the system has both P and T, okay, in this case, then uh, the barrier phase around a closed contour, uh, uh, around the contour shown here, around half of the Brillouin zone, uh, is actually entirely determined by the parity eigenvalue. And um, so it's basically given by the product of the parity eigenvalue at these four uh, high symmetry points, uh, you know, with momentum 0, 0, 0 pi, pi 0, pi pi, okay? <coughs> So, um, and again, this proof of this is the following. Uh, uh, this inversion symmetry basically relates k and minus k, uh, wave function k and minus k. So we can pick a gauge where uh, the u of minus k is just the parity operator acting on u of k, where k is uh, positive. Right? So this relates the uh, wave function at positive k and uh, negative k. And then in this gauge, uh, the barrier connection uh, has to be opposite to each other at opposite momentum. Then if we look at, for example, a barrier phase around this contour, uh, and the k and minus k uh, terms in the integrand, they completely cancel each other. But one might expect that this uh, contour integral always gives zero. 
But a caveat is that uh, notice that when k is zero, uh, if the p acting on u at k equals zero, the wave function at k equals zero, it will give us just plus minus one uh, multiplied by this wave function because k equals zero uh, is a fixed point under the inversion symmetry. Uh, so if the parity of the, the wave function is uh, <coughs> odd on the parity, uh, then uh, this choice of gauge encounters a pi discontinuity. Right? And this uh, leads to a contribution of pi to this barrier phase. Okay. So that's why if we look at uh, the uh, barrier phase around this closed contour, uh, it's uh, entirely given by the product of parity eigenvalue. If the parity eigenvalue is uh, the product of the parity eigenvalue is plus one, then the barrier phase around this contour is zero. Uh, if it's minus one, you get a barrier phase of pi. And in the latter case, uh, there must be an odd number of drag points uh, within half of this ground zone. And this is exactly the situation uh, in graphing. So if you look at the uh, parity of the bands at these gamma point and m points, the product parity is actually minus one. Okay? So even though the drag point itself is located uh, at k point away from all these high symmetry points, its existence is actually guaranteed by the parity of these bands uh, at gamma and m. So um, uh, we can now uh, also uh, uh, use this parity criterion to understand how these drag points uh, can be uh, removed. So imagine now uh, stretching this uh, honeycomb lattice uh, uh, by a, 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 a great amount. So let's change this uh, hopping from t to t plus delta t. So in the limit where delta t is sufficient large when it's bigger than t, okay, then what happens is that uh, the system basically uh, essentially is uh, adiabatic connected to the dimerized limit, right? Because the bonds, on the horizontal bonds, uh, the atoms are so strongly coupled, they essentially form bonding and antibonding orbitals. And uh, when the additional hoppings connecting these dimers are small, uh, essentially the system is adiabatic connected to an atomic insider. So in that case, we get a gap spectrum without direct points. Okay? And again, one will see that uh, this condition uh, is one-to-one -one correspondence with the parity criterion. So in the limit where the delta t is bigger than t, the parity of bands at all the uh, high symmetry points are plus one. <coughs> okay, so this uh, is an atomic limit and direct points indeed disappear. So as we increase delta t from zero to bigger than t, what happens is that the original direct points start to move towards each other and eventually they merge and open up gap. Okay, so. so by yeah. your previous slide, they must merge at an endpoint? They must, here they merge at a gamma point. So they merge at the gamma yeah, point. Which is another, right. yeah, which is another, exactly, yeah. Right. Okay, so, um, so we're not going to, uh, you know, in, in reality, you know, to uh, make the hopping along one bond twice as big as the other is completely unrealistic for real graphing. So uh, we're not going to uh, 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 be worried about that. So instead, we're now uh, thinking about uh, other ways without merging to drag points, you know, leaving the drag points at k and plus minus k, uh, are there ways to break this PT symmetry and open up the gap? So one way is to break the inversion symmetry, and this can be done uh, theoretically by making the two atoms uh, have slightly different uh, on-site potential, and so that now this uh, inversion symmetry around the center of the uh, hex bond uh, is gone. And with this sublattice potential difference, and one can indeed see that it acts as a mass term for the Dirac fermion, and uh, that leads to a gap uh, state. And this gap state is adiabatic connected to the atomic limit. Uh, just imagine that this on-site potential delta is sufficiently large, then uh, all the electron would prefer sitting on one of the sublattice. So this is obviously an atomic intruder. Uh, there's another way of opening a gap is to break time rule symmetry uh, while leaving inversion symmetry present. Uh, this is introduced by uh, the Hodain uh, in his uh, PIL paper. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the, his model. Uh, in addition to the nearest neighbor hopping, uh, he introduced a second neighbor hopping within the same sublattice, and that's purely imaginary. Uh, so this kind of imaginary hopping uh, generates a flux uh, that breaks time of symmetry. And in this case, uh, this uh, leads to a drag mass that is opposite for the two sublattices. So again, one can take this uh, term uh, that's defined in the lattice and uh, translate it into uh, momentum space and then uh, linearize 
uh, the dispersion, and we, we end up with this continuum model, which now has a diagonal term. And uh, the C again uh, labels the two values, so we get a mass term which is uh, opposite at the two values. Okay, and this mass is proportional to the magnitude of this uh, imaginal hopping. Now, interestingly, this gap states uh, is not really directly connected to the atomic insular. Uh, one can already see this from the phase diagram. So, in the presence of both this imaginary hopping and the sublattice potential difference, uh, there's a competition between two kinds of gap states. Uh, a gap closing transition uh, has to be encountered if one wants to change parameter from one regime to the other regime. So, we say that the two uh, in splitting states that differ uh, uh, with each other, they're separate by a gap closing transition. And one can understand why uh, immediately from the continuum model, uh, because in the case of the sublattice gap, the two values has mass of the same sign, while uh, in this Hothain model, the two values has mass of opposite sign. So in order to go from one to the other, uh, the direct mass within one of the two values has to change sign. So when the gap, uh, when the mass goes to zero, uh, that is the transition point. So there has to be a phase transition from the Hothain insider to the uh, atomic insider. So this now leads to this uh, concept of uh, topology, that the two gap states uh, has to be separated by a phase transition. Uh, they are topologically different. Um, one way to see this um, distinction uh, is to consider a domain wall uh, between the uh, Hodan insular and the atomic insular. And uh, because they differ by the direct fermion with the uh, opposite sign of the mass, uh, we can uh, look at this uh, interface problem by solving this uh, two component direct equation with a spatial dependent mass, right, uh, m as a function of x. Uh, so on the one side, the mass is positive. On the other side of the interface, the mass is uh, negative. And uh, this uh, can be explicitly solved. Uh, <coughs> so in order to, <coughs> uh, in this problem, because the translation invariance along the x direction is broken, so we replace momentum px uh, by the derivative with respect to x. So this leads to uh, interesting uh, states that are localized right at the interface. And uh, these uh, uh, the domain wall fermions in the high energy context. Uh, they root, uh, have a, a linear dispersion. And these states connect connection and valence bands. Right? So both sides of the domain wall are gapped. Uh, but there are states localized right at the domain wall. And the wave function is shown here. Uh, exponentially localized at the interface. And they move uh, parallel to this interface. So these are uh, one-dimensional chiral fermions, and they are uh, 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 essentially equivalent to the quantum four edge states. They move only in one direction. They connect connection valence bands. They cannot be destroyed. And uh, you know, this type of uh, gap is, uh, uh, edge states is a signal that there is a topological property of the ball. <clears throat> so, um, so indeed, you know, if we look at uh, the, compare the quantum Hall state uh, we, due to the Landau levels and the Hovain model. <clears throat> the bulk can be, looks very different. In one case, we have uh, flat bands, the Landau levels. In the other case, we have well-defined connection valence bands. Uh, but if you look at the edge property, they all have the chiral uh, one-dimensional edge states. So this uh, is a uh, universal feature of uh, topological states uh, known as bulk boundary correspondence, uh, that the interface between topologically distant if uh, distinct states, the uh, host gap is boundary states, and these boundary states has universal properties. And uh, in this context of this quantum Hall states, uh, there's a topological index known as the Chen number, which is given by the integral of Barrett curvature uh, over the entire Brillouin zone. This is a completely definition from the point of view of the bulk, but it's also equal to the uh, number of edge modes, uh, the difference of the right moving and left moving edge modes. And the right hand side is completely a boundary uh, point of view, uh, but the bulk and boundary, uh, they are exactly correspond to each other. <coughs> so, um, so one thing I want to mention that uh, when we discuss uh, from the point of view of direct fermions, uh, the this direct fermion essentially captures uh, the change of topology. So when the mass of the direct fermion changes sign, we know that there's a change of topological uh, nature, but uh, which side of this transition is topological, which side is not. Uh, that uh, really depends on the global properties uh, of the full wave function in the Brimon zone. Uh, so the best you can infer by just looking at the direct equation itself is that there's a change of topology. 
uh, but it's, it, one cannot infer just from the drug equation uh, which side is a positive mass side or negative side, which side is topological, which side is not. In fact, the sign of direct mass is not even gauge invariant uh, in, the, uh, in the high energy uh, context. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the, you know, it's like the, the, the drug formula uh, is a property of the uh, uh, IR, while topology depends on the, topo uh, the global properties at the UV scale. Right? So, drug formula is like the tip of the iceberg. <clears throat> so, in this case of this, for example, this Hodan model, you know, we know that uh, it differs from the atomic, uh, from the uh, sublattice gap state by a mass reversal. But we also know that the sublattice gap state is a direct connect to the atomic insulator. So this tells us that the, uh, this whole insulator is non-trivial. Uh, I have a small question. Right. Yeah. Please uh, feel free to ask questions. Yes. Yeah. So in the Landau level, is, right. there, is there a way to like assign some sort of topological invariant to each Landau level? Yes. Yes. You can define the magnetic uh, brillium zone. And then uh, again, using the same chain number to look at. So we introduce some sort of a weak potential for the lattice. One could think of that way, yeah. I see. You don't have to, but you know, you could think of that way. Yes. <coughs> okay. So, um, so now I've uh, emphasized that the uh, the topology really requires knowing the wave function throughout the Brillouin zone, but uh, you know that usually uh, is very uh, difficult to obtain. Uh, it's very numerically very cost. Cost a lot, uh, but again, it turned out that uh, if the system has inversion symmetry, uh, with, but without time reversal, then uh, again, there's a simple criterion for this, uh, this changing switcher. And um, in this case, we again, as we uh, we uh, just uh, uh, showed that if you look at the barrier phase uh, around half of the Brillouin zone, uh, it's entirely determined by the parity eigenvalue. So when the product parity is minus one, the barrier phase is pi. So earlier we said that. If time rule symmetry is also present, then there must be an odd number of direct points in half of the real zone. But if the time rule symmetry is broken, then what we know is that uh, a uh, barrier phase of pi implies that the integral of barrier curvature in half of the real zone is also pi. And then inversion symmetry guarantees that the integral of barrier curvature, barrier curvature has to be an uh, even function of k. So the uh, barrier curvature of the other half of the real zone is also pi. So they add up to 2 pi. Okay, this tells us that the Chen number has to be an odd integer uh, when the product parity is minus one. So just looking at the wave function at these uh, high symmetry points, it gives us a very strong constraint on the Chen number. So if the product parity is minus one, the Chen number has to be odd, has to be non-zero. Again, this Hodan model we can verify that explicitly. Uh, you know, the Hodan model introduces a gap to the drag point without changing much the wave function uh, at these gamma and m points. So the product of parity is still minus one. So yes, can I ask uh, the, the last question sure. slide? So so there are two, like on those like uh, contour, there are there are two other frames that. Uh, so these parts cancel each other. Uh -huh. If you look at half of the brown, half of the brown zone is topologically like a ribbon. Uh -huh. Right. So it uh -huh. has only two boundaries. I I uh -huh. I see. So. So, so, so this part and this part, they exactly cancel each other. I see. So one is only left with this part and this part. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So, so now I've introduced, you know, theoretically different ways of gapping graphene. Uh, it turned out that neither uh, is, uh, is is easy to realize. Uh, you know, people are still trying to understand. You know, for example, if you put a graphene on a boron nitride, uh, it is known to induce a gap uh, under under proper conditions, but the magnitude of this gap is still being discussed. And the origin of this gap is still being discussed. Uh, and uh, the, uh, also, the uh, Hodane uh, insulator requires this uh, uh, sort of optical flux, uh, which is uh, very hard to achieve. Uh, so far, to my knowledge, has not been realized in graphene. Um, but some closely related uh, topological states have been uh, discovered. For example, uh, back in 2013, uh, this quantum non hall state, this chain insulator state, has been uh, realized in magnetic topological insular films. And again, the idea is similar uh, that these topological insular films has the direct surface states on the top and bottom surface, uh, a different kind of direct states than graphene. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, magnetism creates gaps uh, that is similar to this gap opening uh, in the uh, graphene model. So this realizes the chain insular. Uh, and uh, uh, Feng Wang will discuss, I think, that uh, chain insular uh, in uh, trilayer graphene on HBN, and in this case, uh, the two values 
have opposite uh, barrier curvature, but then uh, strong uh, inter electron interaction uh, spontaneously polarize the valleys, and that leads to uh, changing training states. And you see that the quantized uh, hot conductance uh, on the vanishing external magnetic field. So, um, uh, so this is a sort of another idea that uh, we played around uh, back uh, some time ago. And, uh, uh, you know, we're thinking about using circuit prize light as a way to induce this, this kind of hot end gap. And the general idea is the following, that if you take a material and uh, shine light in the, uh, under the right condition, uh, the light cannot be absorbed because of the energy mismatch. And in this kind of non-absorbing material, uh, light can uh, introduce uh, changes to the band structure. For example, it's known that there's an effect called inverse Faraday effect, where uh, circular polarized light effectively can induce a DC magnetization. Uh, and this effect has been known for, for decades, has been demonstrated. Uh, so, what, uh, uh, so we took inspiration from this work, and we think about using circular polarized light to introduce a, uh, a mass term for the direct from the graphene. And uh, the idea is that uh, if you look at uh, the presence of the uh, external uh, vector potential uh, due to the electromagnetic field, which is time dependent, and uh, the uh, modified direct Hamiltonian in the presence of this vector potential uh, contains additional terms. Right? So one of the terms corresponds to absorbing a photon uh, at a frequency omega, and that term corresponds to emitting a photon uh, at a frequency <coughs> omega. And uh, if the frequency is chosen such that interband transition is not possible. So, for example, you know, if the frequency of the photon is so large as to exceed the entire bandwidth of graphene, right, then uh, uh, the system cannot really uh, absorb this photon, cannot create any uh, interband transitions. Uh, then uh, the effect of this uh, uh, electromagnetic field, we can only see it from second order perturbation theory, where we absorb a photon and emit it. Right? There's a virtual process of emission and uh, 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 and uh, emitting and uh, uh, absorbing photons. And, uh, and the, the two intermediate states have uh, opposite uh, energy, uh, so that's why we get a commutator between these H1, H minus 1. And, uh, and this exactly gives us a mass term, because essentially H1 contains the term which is sigma x plus i sigma y, H minus 1 contains the term which is sigma x minus i sigma y. So the commutator of them generates a mass term. So sigma corresponds to the two. Uh, uh, Subplasses, and uh, and of course in the real graphene this is very unrealistic because uh, uh, the bandwidth of graphene is so large that in order to uh, use a, uh, a photon uh, energy to exceed the bandwidth is completely unrealistic. Uh, however, now you know with all these uh, Mori materials which has a very narrow bandwidth, uh, it I think it's maybe a good time to revisit uh, this kind of system. Uh, so the idea that we uh, choose a photon energy uh, that is Below the direct gap, and this cannot induce any interband transition, uh, but it can be used to uh, modify the band structure of graphene in interesting ways. <clears throat> okay, so now let me. Uh, uh, so I've now described sort of various ways of introducing gaps to graphene, and uh, and let's now move on to uh, a uh, the case of the uh, pristine graphene without any gaps. Uh, the number type of topological states, which is the quantum Hall states, this will arise in the presence of external magnetic field. And uh, uh, it turns out that the lambda levels for drag fermions has a very interesting structure. Instead of having equally spaced lambda levels, here uh, the lambda level is proportional to the square root of n, so it's not uniformly uh, uh, spaced. And uh, also, uh, there are basically uh, lambda levels both in the conduction and valence bands uh, at uh, plus e and minus e they form electron hole symmetric a spectrum. Uh, in particular, there is a zero energy lambda level, right? Right at zero energy. That's, that is really shared between the conduction and valence band. So this is a rather unique uh, situation. Uh, so each of the lambda levels have spin and value degeneracy uh, at a single particle level. Uh, and if you look at the n equals zero uh, lambda level, the electron wave function uh, uh, is completely uh, polarized on the given sublattice. Uh, for a given value. So value plus k wave function lives on the A sublattice, value minus k wave function lives on the B sublattice. Okay, so this is, uh, we will we'll see, uh, there's a, a lot of interesting consequences about this n equals zero lambda levels. So, um, so uh, to 
discuss this quantum pole states uh, in graphing, uh, so we would like to know how these uh, edge states in the presence of these lambda levels behave. Uh, so for all the conduction band lambda levels, uh, they bend upwards near the edge, so that every time we cross a lambda level, the Hall conductance will change by 4 uh, due to the value in spin degeneracy. Uh, and likewise, all the lambda levels of the valence bands, uh, they bend downwards, right? So the uh, edge states at positive and negative energy, uh, they have opposite velocities. Uh, however, the interesting thing is that this n equals 0 lambda level, uh, that, which is a 4 fold degenerate, turns out that near the edge, uh, two of the states uh, goes upwards, two of the lambda levels bend downwards. Uh, and again, this is the only scenario that is compatible with this electron hole symmetry. Right? It's only a scenario, possibility. And uh, this tells us that uh, the Hall conductance has to be assigned this way, uh, starting from minus 2, when the Fermi energy is uh, slightly below the n equals 0 lambda level, and uh, is plus 2 when slightly above the n equals 0 lambda level. So every time we cross a lambda level, uh, the chain number, the, or the whole conductance will change by 4. Uh, but it has this very symmetric pattern. And uh, near the, uh, you know, if we are at zero energy, what we see that there are uh, edge states uh, at positive energy and negative energy, and they have opposite velocity. Right? Again, related by this particle symmetry. So this can be called an anti-polar uh, edge states, and, and they have opposite chirality. So this is a rather uh, uh, unique situation that is not present in a system with parabolic bands. So this is a comparison here. Right? So if you look at a system of parabolic bands, uh, the uh, Hall conductance is zero when the Fermi energy is inside the gap, and then you know every time you cross another level, it changes by four. So if compared to two cases, we see that in the graphene, the Hall conductance has a different quantization sequence. Uh, it has an extra uh, one half shift, right? So it's instead of uh, having quantum Hall conductance zero, four, eight, it has Hall conductance of two, six, and ten. Right? So uh, so this one half shift uh, really comes from the fact that this lambda level uh, at n equals zero lambda level is half field at charge neutrality. So uh, it's I want to emphasize it. It has nothing to do with uh, it's not directly related at least to this uh, pi bar phase. Uh, later, we will see that when uh, we think about gap graphing, the bare phase is not quantized to be pi anymore, but this quantization pattern uh, still remains. So, so really, this one half sheet is simply because the n equals zero lambda level is half field uh, at charge neutrality. Right? N equals zero lambda level is shared between the conduction valence bands. So, all other lambda levels, they have uh, positive energy and negative energy. They are formed partners. But the n equals zero lambda level uh, comes all by itself, right? So if you have a charge neutral graphene, this n equals zero lambda level has to be uh, half field, right? And when you feel the other half of the uh, n equals zero lambda level, you get the first quantum Hall states, and uh, that has uh, Hall conductance two e square of h. While in the case of a conventional uh, semiconductor, uh, at charge neutrality point, the Hall conductance is actually zero because of the band gap. And then when you feel the first uh, uh, lambda level, you get the Hall conductance 4 e square of h. So this um, uh, quantization pattern is indeed uh, seen experimentally. And if you look at the Hall conductance you know, GXY, shown in red, it has this uh, sequence with a one-half uh, shift. Now notice that this uh, right at time trailer point, uh, this n equals 0 lambda level is there. Uh, but because it's half field, because of electron hole symmetry, uh, the Hall effect completely vanishes. So it looks like this charge neutrality point, uh, that despite it has this very unique n equals zero lambda level, uh, doesn't lead to much interesting consequence uh, in uh, in quantum transport. Right. So, uh, uh, however, uh, now I want to move on to this paper uh, by by Paul and sitting here, uh, and uh, uh, it's a remarkable work that really revealed, in my opinion, uh, the peculiar property of this n equals zero on the level in graphene. Okay, so, so you know, if you look at this paper published in Nature with you know twenty thousand citations, uh, this paper uh, has maybe two hundred citations. Uh, despite you know this uh, difference of a factor of a hundred, I think it reveals a uh, property uh, just as fundamental as as this. Okay, <clears throat> okay so 
So these authors, they studied basically the thermoelectric effects uh, in graphene under magnetic field. So let me first explain a little bit. What about uh, How much time do I have? Uh, you have about 30 minutes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. 35 minutes. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so this uh, thermoelectric effect refers to uh, the conversion between uh, electricity and heat, right? Uh, so in particular, uh, these are the uh, transport equations. Uh, so E is electric field, J is the charge current, uh, T is temperature, Q is the heat current. Right? So for example, if you look at diagonal elements, uh, this is the resistivity rho and the thermal conductivity kappa. The off-diagonal term uh, relates uh, heat and electricity. This is what we are now talking about. So this S is called a thermal power. It describes a voltage that is generated uh, by a temperature gradient. Uh, uh, this is uh, described in the open circuit uh, geometry. Uh, there's no current flow, right, because the system is an uh, open circuit. And the ratio of the voltage divided by the temperature gradient defines the thermal power. And what is happening here is that uh, if one side of the uh, uh, system is uh, hot, it tends to uh, induce a flow of charge carriers to the other side that leads to a pile up of extra charge. Right? So that generates a voltage. Um, and uh, the other uh, off diagonal elements uh, is essentially related to uh, the thermal power by Onsaga's uh, reciprocal relation. So there's only a single uh, quantity describing the thermal electric effect, the thermal power. Now, under magnetic field, uh, all these transport coefficients become tensors. They have both diagonal elements and off-diagonal elements. The diagonal elements of the thermal power is often referred to as the Seebeck coefficient. The off-diagonal elements is often referred to as, uh, is known as Nernst. So, um, so this is uh, what is measured, uh, the thermal power and, uh, or the Seebeck coefficient and Nernst, along with the uh, uh, conductivity. So conductivity plot is shown here in GXX. And, uh, and, and you see that in the uh, quantum power effect, when you have half your London level, the GXX has a peak, right? The longitudinal connectance has a peak. Uh, the uh, purple curves are the uh, Seebeck coefficient and the Nernst coefficient. And they also have very interesting uh, uh, structures, right? You see, uh, you see peaks uh, at certain uh, uh, densities, right? Obviously related to London level physics. Uh, now, uh, the uh, most important paper in uh, about thermal electric effect in a quantum power regime is this work by Gervin and Johnson. Uh, they developed the theory for the system with parabolic bands, okay, not for graphene. This was back in 1982. And uh, they look at this quantity, which is the thermal power, the Seebeck coefficient, and they showed us that when a lambda level is half filled, uh, the Seebeck coefficient has a peak. And with this value, which is universal. It only depends on the Boltzmann constant, the electron charge, uh, and this lambda level index n. Right? So for example, if you go to the lowest lambda level uh, in the, uh, say, like garden arsenic, uh, n will be zero. So there is a non-vanishing thermal power uh, uh, for half field n equals zero lambda level in garden arsenic. So these authors, they actually look at this uh, quantity. And indeed, for all the uh, lambda levels in graphene away from n equals zero, no, one may be tempted to, uh, to use this formula because after all, uh, at the edge, the lambda level bends upwards and downwards, uh, similar to the case of Guy Marsnik. Uh, but the, the authors have a, a, a brilliant insight that uh, this half integer shift implies that this uh, thermal power should decrease uh, not as 1 over n plus 1 half, but just as 1 over n, right? And, and you know, this is it's, it's, it's amazing <laughs> insight. Uh, and indeed, this is the case, okay? So for all the uh, uh, other London levels, and it's not equal to zero, uh, the data uh, fits well with this, fits reasonably well with this modified formula from Kirby and Johnson. But then, uh, if you look at this formula for n equals zero London level, this community will diverge if you literally take n equals zero. Uh, but instead, the thermal power vanishes right at charging charge point when the n equals zero London level is half field. So the authors noted this, and, and they made a, a remark. It is not clear how the uh, edge current calculation of Gerwin Johnson is to be generalized to the n equals zero lambda level, uh, because this n equals zero lambda level is neither electron-like nor hole-like. Right? When we look at the edge state of n equals zero lambda level, it's different from all other lambda levels. And um, uh, and now uh, something uh, remarkable came out that uh, uh, instead of plotting 
the data as the CBAC and the NERS, uh, they uh, convert the data using both the CBAC and the NERS, as well as uh, longitudinal resistivity and hall resistivity. Putting all these quantities together, they convert it into something called, uh, I guess in the literature, it's not really a universally accepted name. It's thermoelectric connectivity. Let's just call it that way. Uh, the thermoelectric connectivity, I'll explain in a minute. Uh, again, it has diagonal off diagonal elements, r x x and r x y. And when we look at r x y, uh, you see that different lambda levels seems to behave more or less equally. That the n equals 0 lambda level, there's a peak in r x y, uh, which is really comparable to the other lambda levels. Right. So this was uh, observation was made, and uh, and uh, uh, this is written in the paper. There's actually no prediction of what peak value of alpha x y should be at the n equals zero in graphene, and uh, this observation is in need of a theoretical explanation. Right. So let me first uh, describe what is this alpha. Um, so uh, you know, for uh, experiments, it's uh, often done in the open circular geometry. Uh, so we like to relate the voltage. Uh, to a temperature gradient in the open circuit. Uh, but for uh, theorists, right, it's uh, uh, more often we used to think of that current is being driven by the temperature gradient, being driven by the applied electric field. Likewise, heat current is driven by the temperature gradient electric field. So, uh, so this is a, a different set of equations uh, that contains essentially equivalent information but formulated in different ways. Right? So now this alpha, the thermoelectric connectivity alpha, is defined as the current that is generated by a temperature gradient uh, in the absence of any electric field. So this really requires a closed circuit, right? So uh, a short circuit current uh, divided by the temperature gradient. Uh, so this thermal electric connectivity is related to uh, the CBAC, the thermal power and the connectivity. So they are related this way. Okay, the, the thermal power is a product of the uh, thermal electric connectivity and resistivity. Now, I remind you that, again, in magnetic field, all these quantities are matrices. Right? So we really have to use the matrix product. Okay? So that's why, uh, after measuring rho xx and rho xy, sx and sxy, one can convert uh, into this thermoelectric connectivity alpha. So now, what makes this uh, n equals 0 on the level special is that uh, because they are half electron and half field, right? half hole. So, so we need to uh, now uh, look at how electron holes uh, show uh, thermoelectric response, right? And uh, and uh, so uh, let's look at this here. Now, one thing I want to mention that uh, here the thermoelectric connectivity is defined as the uh, charge current uh, in response to the temperature gradient. But again, Ansara relation tells us that one can also think about the uh, thermoelectric connectivity as the heat current uh, divided by the applied electric field, right? So this turns out to be more uh, easier to to visualize. So we would like to think about what is the heat current that is generated by a applied electric field in the absence of any temperature gradient. So, so first, let's consider the absence of magnetic field. Right? So let's compare systems of, uh, where the carriers are electrons and a system where the carriers are holes. In the presence of the applied electric field, uh, you know, holes move parallel to electric field, while uh, the uh, electrons move opposite to applied electric field. So the charge current are the same. In the two cases, right? A system electron and holes, the the uh, the connectivity has the same sign, but the heat current is obviously different because heat current is generated by entropy. It's about you know uh, particles moving from one side to the other that carry a heat current uh, of a given sign, right? But if the carriers move from the in the opposite direction, the heat current will be opposite. Okay? So this image tells us that. Uh, the heat current divided by the uh, applied electric field that defines alpha xx. So this is odd under a charge conjugation. Right? Uh, and because of the uh, thermal power s is related to alpha xx, uh, it also changes sign under charge conjugation. On the other hand, now let's consider the case of applied external magnetic field. Uh, and now let's apply the electric field uh, in the y direction and look at the motion of uh, particles uh, along the x direction. Uh, in the magnetic field, we know that the uh, charged particles uh, experience a Lorentz force, uh, so they actually drift uh, in the direction, which is a, in the cross product between E and B, with a drift velocity that's given by this. <coughs> Notice that this drift velocity is the same for electron holes. Uh, this is because that the, um, 
the drift velocity is determined by the balance of the Lorentz force, which is uh, E times V cross B being equal to the electric force due to the external electric field. So this uh, charge E uh, drops out. So for electron holes, they all drift in the same direction. Okay? And because electrons carry opposite charge, now the electrical current is opposite in these two cases, but the heat current is the same. Okay? So this means that, uh, that the rho xy is odd from the charge communication. Right? Which we all know that uh, electron holes have the opposite Hawking connectivity, that's why the Hawking connectivity vanishes at charging charging. Uh, but this also means that the alpha xy uh, is even on the charge contribution. So alpha xy and alpha xy are even on the charge contribution. So that's why uh, when we look at these uh, 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 charging charge pointing graphing, uh, the uh, sxx, uh, sxx vanishes at charging charge and changes sign across it. But uh, alpha xy uh, is right peaked right at the charging charge. And um, moreover, uh, we can now again, uh, using this uh, edge states, this very peculiar and bipolar edge states, to calculate uh, this quantity, this thermoelectric Hawking activity, uh, right at n equals zero lambda level. And uh, imagine that one, uh, you know, let's think about the temperature gradient in the y direction. So one side of the edge is hot than the other. So uh, because of this uh, 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 raised temperature, uh, there will be additional uh, electrons, uh, excited electrons, and additional uh, excited holes. Uh, but, and the electron holes, they have opposite velocity, right? Because the velocity is the uh, uh, derivative energy with respect to K. Uh, you can see here, the positive energy and negative energy modes have different velocity. So this leads to uh, positive charge moving in one direction, negative charge moving in the opposite direction uh, in the presence of this temperature gradient. And that leads to a net heat current in the x direction, a net charge current in the x direction. Okay, so the electron hole contribution uh, adds up. Um, moreover, uh, we can actually compute this alpha xy, uh, and so I'm going to work under this condition that temperature is much smaller than the uh, uh, cyclone energy, so that I only need to consider the n equals zero on the level. And also, I'm assuming that temperature is much bigger than the solar induced broadening. So essentially, I'm working in the clean limit. And then, uh, so, the, uh, so this is the current that is generated by a temperature gradient. Okay? Uh, and the calculation is essentially a thermoelectric version of the um, lambda butica calculation of the conductance. So uh, when we compute the uh, charge conductance, anytime we have a, a left moving modes, it contributes a conductance uh, e squared of h. Right? And the way that comes out is that you take the derivative of the Fermi distribution with respect to applied voltage and uh, integrate over all the modes that are left moving. Here, uh, in order to calculate the uh, heat, the, the charge current, uh, not due to applied voltage, but due to the temperature gradient, we look at the uh, change of the distribution, uh, the Fermi distribution due to a temperature delta T and we integrate over all the modes that are left moving, right? So, uh, so this gives us the uh, electron contribution uh, to the charge current under the temperature gradient. And there's a corresponding uh, right moving modes, right? Uh, but these modes are carried by holes. Uh, so this uh, JE are the number of current of the electrons and JH are the number of current of holes. They are opposite to each other. They're all given by this formula shown here. Uh, the range of the integration of the energy is from zero to infinity for electrons, from minus infinity to zero for holes. Okay, because positive and negative energy modes they're moving opposite directions. And uh, because of the Fermi distribution, you know, uh, in this Fermi distribution, the derivative with respect to temperature can be made uh, equal to the related to the derivative of distribution with respect to E uh, multiplied by this conversion factor. Then uh, we are left with this expression, uh, and this integral gives us log two. Okay, so this tells us that the uh, alpha x y uh, is the sum over uh, now the uh, charge current due to the electron and charge current due to the hole uh, divided by delta t is log two times e k b divided by h. So it's a completely universal and quantized 
uh, value. Okay, so this is the uh, thermoelectric uh, Hawk connectivity, and this uh, and this is where this 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 green line uh, in this paper uh, indicates. So you see that the measured value is reasonably close to this quantized value. Now, one thing I should mention is that uh, this quantization only holds when temperature is bigger than the disorder uh, broadening. Uh, uh, if temperature is smaller than disorder broadening, uh, it, the thermoelectric Hawk connectivity will be suppressed. Okay, so the cleaner the sample, uh, the easier it is to reach this quantized value. So recently, we generalized this formula uh, to three-dimensional systems with a linear dispersion, and, uh, and, and something similar occurs there. Now, uh, so far, you know, again, I've uh, shown you this uh, quantized thermoelectric Hawk connectivity from the point of view of just the edge states. Uh, you know, this result actually can also be obtained from the bulk point of view. I'm not going through this derivation. Uh, that is basically the alpha xy uh, in this kind of clean limit in the presence of magnetic field. This alpha xy is really entropy density divided by magnetic field. Uh, and if we have a half field on the level, every state uh, has a uh, half probability of being occupied and half being empty. That leads to an entropy of log 2 times kb multiplied by the number level degeneracy. And uh, that, uh, when you divide by magnetic field, uh, this part cancels out. So again, we get this formula log 2 kb over uh, times e divided by h. So the point is, I want to emphasize that uh, uh, if you have a finite entropy density, uh, due to the massive Landau level degeneracy, this leads to a large R x y at low temperature, and this is rather unusual. Okay, you take an ordinary metal, uh, the entropy would always decrease as uh, temperature T in the degenerate regime because entropy is related to uh, number of states uh, around the Fermi level within the energy range of KBT. So entropy always decreases uh, with temperature in the ordinary metal, but because of these Landau levels, there's a massive degeneracy. We can get a finite entropy density down to zero temperature, or at least when temperature is bigger than disorder broadening. So this leads to very large thermoelectric response. So, you know, so this is something that uh, I'm recently very obsessed with, uh, that uh, one can maybe actually use this quantum Hall system uh, to do something uh, useful. Right? Uh, so one can convert uh, the heat into electricity, or one can use uh, charge current for thermoelectric cooling. And, uh, and this is uh, the, the, uh, uh, maybe, uh, one, you know, for example, in this uh, geometry, uh, we have a temperature gradient along the y direction. So the heat current runs from, the, let's say, the hot side to the cold side. And this will generate a transverse current between uh, these two electrical leads. And uh, this current can be used to uh, power an external resistance uh, outload. And uh, again, because of this large thermoelectric Hall connectivity at low temperature, so this can have a very high efficiency uh, at, at low temperature. Okay. <clears throat> so I will let you know if this works. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, okay. So now let me. Uh, uh, how much? Is it? Fifty minutes. Okay. So now let me move on to the last part of the talk. So I've described now the uh, the two cases. Uh, in the absence of external magnetic field, uh, one can generate gaps uh, by breaking inversion symmetry by breaking uh, time reversal symmetry. Uh, and I've also discussed uh, without any uh, of these gaps, when you apply magnetic field, you get lambda levels. Uh, now we put them together, right? So what if uh, we apply magnetic field to a gap graphene? Right? How would the uh, unequal, the lambda level spectrum be modified by the presence of gaps? Um, again, one can work out the lambda level spectrum of uh, massive draft fermions uh, with a mass m, and uh, in this case, uh, this is lambda level spectrum. Uh, that uh, uh, now inside the square root, in addition to, to this term, uh, there's an actual m square term, and this holds for all the uh, uh, lambda levels and uh, greater or equal to one. Uh, but the n equal zero lambda level again is special. Uh, uh, you know, again, n equal zero lambda level uh, comes by itself without a partner. So when we introduce a mass to the Dirac fermion, this n equal zero lambda level is uh, just being uh, changed to energy equal m. So when m is positive, it comes to the conduction band edge. Uh, when m is negative, it comes to the valence band edge. Right? So now the spectrum is not <coughs> particle symmetric anymore. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so with this lifted uh, lambda level degeneracy, uh, one, can, uh, uh, one can look at the quantization sequence again. Right? So uh, in the case of uh, when we apply a subless potential to graphene, 
uh, the uh, the n equals zero lambda level. Remember that coming from the two values. Uh, in one valley, it's all polarized on a sub lattice. In the other valley, it's all on the b sub lattice. So when there is a sub lattice potential difference, uh, these two sets of n equals zero lambda levels are no longer degenerate. So one of them goes to the connection band edge, the other goes to the valence band edge, right? So the fourfold degenerate n equals zero lambda level is split into a twofold and another twofold. So this twofold comes from spin degeneracy, right? All other lambda levels are, are the same. Uh, that's remain degenerate because you know, when you change the sign of m from plus to minus, all the other lambda level energies uh, remain the same. So we will get this quantization sequence. You see, it's actually uh, you know very similar to the original one. We still get quantization six, you know, two, six, ten, uh, but now there's an additional n equals zero uh, lambda level. Right. On the other hand, if we take this uh, Hodane model, uh, the uh, Hodane model, you know, uh, does not break the degeneracy between the two sublattices, so the n equals zero lambda level do not split. Okay, so they just shift either to the conduction band edge or to the valence band edge, depending on the sign of the uh, of the flux. So here, what happens is that the condensation pattern is, you know, two six ten in the conduction band minus two minus six minus ten in the valence band. So uh, when you change from n to p type, the Hall conductor then jump directly from minus two to plus two without going through zero. Right. Now, in both cases, you know, uh, if you look at the high energy lambda level, the quantization pattern is really, uh, in, you know, in fact, even down to the zero energy, the quantization pattern is really the, the same as, as graphene, right? as, a, as a pristine graphene. It says always it's one half shift. Despite that, now uh, this barrier phase is no longer quantized to be pi. Right? So what we see is that, again, this, uh, I want to emphasize that this shifted one half shift of the sequence of lambda level really coming from this n equals zero lambda level being half field as neutrality, but right? it doesn't depend on how these lambda levels are split. Okay. So, um, so this is a summer school, so I'm supposed to maybe ask them questions. So, uh, so you know, this uh, uh, this brings to the following interesting question. So, um, so if you uh, uh, think about uh, the uh, how Dirac in the original came up with his uh, Dirac equation. He was interested in uh, uh, understanding uh, the you know, fundamental particles, right, elementary particles. And uh, his equation, you know, gave us a, uh, a E and minus E symmetric spectrum. So for a long time, he was puzzled how to interpret the negative energy states. Right? Uh, at the end, uh, he realized that uh, uh, the negative energy states are already occupied. And uh, when you, you know, in, the, in, the, in the universe, and occasionally, uh, maybe uh, there's a missing uh, electron occupying the negative energy states, and this is a hole, right? So he said that the hole, if there were one, would be a new kind of particle unknown to experimental physics, having the same mass and optic charge of the electron. Of course, we now know it's just positron, right? So uh, essentially, the Dirac equation describes electron and positron all at once. Yeah. Um, uh, now, imagine that you can turn on magnetic field, right? Do this experiment in vacuum. Uh, then you know there would also be you know, as imagine that there's some combining potential, so we get you know quantum Hall sequence of electron you know which we can access to. There's also quantum Hall sequence for positrons, but probably we cannot access to. Uh, so we know that the uh, the Dirac equation should uh, reduce to the Schrodinger equation uh, if we talk about low energy states just near the gap edge, right? Uh, so this is taking the non relativistic limit. Of the Dirac equation should recover the Schrodinger equation, but if you look at the uh, what I've described for the case of a massive Dirac fermion, the uh, quantum Hall sequence uh, always comes with a one half shift, while for the Schrodinger uh, electron for parabolic bands, we usually think there's no extra half shift. So how do you reconcile uh, these two different quantum Hall sequence when we take the non relativistic limit of the Dirac equation? Why we apparently do not recover the quantum Hall sequence? Of the parabolic bands, okay. this is something to think about. <coughs> okay, so um, now, uh, now let me um, uh, very quickly uh, show that uh, indeed uh, the lambda level spectrum of these uh, massive dark fermions has been observed. Uh, maybe not yet in graphene. Uh, I'm not very familiar. Uh, but th in this case, for example, if you look at surface state of topological insular uh, lattice selenide, it has four Dirac cones. Uh, again, away from high symmetry points, very similar to graphene. Uh, and uh, in this system, the Dirac points are protected by a uh, certain uh, symmetry, the re reflection symmetry. But uh, a surface reconstruction, which is found experimentally, 
uh, breaks one of the uh, mirror symmetries. So the consequence is that two of the direct points remain gapless, but the other two open up uh, gap. And, uh, and indeed, if you look at the uh, STM data, uh, mm -hmm. there's an n equals zero lambda level, which does not change with the magnetic field. But there are two additional lambda levels, which also does not change with the magnetic field. So these two additional lambda levels are precisely the gap direct points uh, at opposite momentum. So one has a positive mass, one has a negative mass. So these are, uh, and while the central uh, peak is the, the two remaining gap direct points. So, um, so this is an um, example. Uh, and uh, 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 another beautiful experiment, okay, a uh, different aspect of the uh, quantum power problem come from uh, this Ali Hassan experiment on business in high magnetic field. So, you know, I've talked a lot about this, uh, the domain walls, that if you go across the domain wall, the gap will close, and uh, right at the main wall, there will be uh, gapless topological boundary modes. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, for a long time, this was, uh, uh, you know, this was, this was what we expect from theory, right? But, but we don't see it in experiments uh, until now. Until now. So, um, so on the surface of business, what happened is there are uh, six uh, valleys, okay? unlike graphene, which has two valleys, here you have six valleys, and uh, in the magnetic field, uh, due to the interactions, uh, when these uh, valley degenerate lambda levels are uh, partially occupied, uh, the system may uh, spontaneously polarize electrons to occupy an integer set of uh, a subset of these degenerate lambda levels. And, um, and uh, uh, for example, you know, if you look at uh, you know, this image here, uh, you know, here you see the lambda orbitals are oriented uh, in this direction, while here the lambda orbitals are oriented in this direction. So this is telling us that uh, on the left region, uh, electrons are, let's say, all in the B valley, while in the right region, they are occupying a, a different valley. Right? So the uh, whole system, the total uh, turn number uh, is equal from one region to the other region that's set by the density and the external magnetic field. But the turn number uh, of a given valley can change across a domain wall. Right. So this leads to, uh, again, for a given valley, you know, it initially changes from being occupied to empty, or the other valley changes from empty to being occupied. So again, this leads to um, topologically protected modes on the domain wall, where uh, the counter-propagating modes uh, from different valleys uh, coexist uh, in this uh, domain wall. And uh, this is uh, uh, STM uh, data. And you see that away from the domain wall, there's a gap uh, right at Fermi energy. Uh, these are gap topological states. On the right region, likewise, there's a gap. But right at the domain wall, uh, the gap closes, and you get uh, boundary modes. So uh, I'm going to stop here, and uh, uh, thank you.